let's start um, with a little quote um, from Matthew Arnold. He was a professor of poetry at Oxford, um, and he was a school inspector, a job that he didn't particularly like, but he carried on because he felt he had to. Um, and he wrote a lot. Um, and this is from Culture and Anarchy. And I thought that was really useful about our perspectives, your perspectives. Because it says what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls the butterfly. And governors lend a unique and different perspective to what's going on in schools. And that's incredibly valuable. You bring with you relevant experience from your professions and from your life that enable you to work with the school to see what the figure is. When you're in the thick of it, as you know, because some of you work in schools as well, you don't always see the wood for the trees. So I just thought that would be quite a nice link to, to, to really talk about what governors bring to the role. Okay, what we're going to do today is shape our session, the through line if you like. We're going to talk a bit about the context in Oxfordshire, including the people bringing the gap, which is really important to know about, but I can't say it enough. The importance of good governance, and also what we've learned about good governance from inspection and our survey work. We're going to have a little bit of opportunity to talk and learn from each other. I'm going to talk a little bit about the changes to the handbook that happened this September, but also the bigger changes that are going on in 2015, and we really want to hear your views about them, and then take questions at the end. So that's roughly the structure, and I'm going to try and keep to good timing and finish by 11 o'clock, because I know we're already from coffee and break at 11 o'clock, so I'm, I'm not going to run over ahead of you. So, the context for Oxfordshire. I'm not going to read these figures out. You can read them for yourself. We're talking about sort of one sixth of students, uh, pupils, not yet in school, and could be better. Um, and we're all, when I, when, I, when I talk like this, I think, I think, I think it's important to recognise that we're all interested in improving the life chances of young people. That's why I went into this role. We all share a common purpose. So this is where we are at the moment with Oxfordshire. It's better than some local authorities, but I think we all agree that perhaps it could be better. And that's why we're here today. We're not saying it's not, it's not, you know, it's not showing improvement, but when you're talking about individuals who have <coughs> one chance in life to get those crucial grades and move on, then I think we can always say there's room for a little bit more improvement. Um, these are your latest scores for level two and above. Um, I think they show some improvement for key stage one. I'm quite pleased with those. You know them probably. I hope they're similar to yours. I got them from the official statistics. And what's interesting is key stage two is a little bit different. You've got a bit of a dip for the first time. Oxfordshire is the only county in the South East that has dipped. Now, it was on a higher, it was higher up, but, or the only LA, I should say, where it, there's been a bit of a dip. And what's really crucial there is the gap between the free school million pupils and the non free school million pupils. And that's really important. And it's still there in 2014. <coughs> We may have closed it a bit, but it's still there. Okay, still there. <coughs> Closing, but still there. The 2014 figures for GCC are not yet validated, so I can't show you those. Okay? You may have heard that nationally we've gone down five A stars to C, including English and Maths, by about four point something percent. The South East has not gone down as much, so that uh, drop is not as great in the South East. So we do expect these figures to be lower this year. What will be interesting, I think, to see whether and how far the gap has narrowed this year. Because, you know, often when um, there is turbulence around the CD borderline, it can be the most vulnerable students, the people, premium students, who do actually dip down into the deep grade. So it'll be interesting to see this year. As you can see, the gap for last year was high. 
Oxfordshire had a higher gap than a lot of other local authorities in the South East. Although their overall results were better than other authorities in the South East, it's the gap. Often schools, if I've spoken to some of you here today, where there's only one or two pupil premium students, and that's the challenge. And, you know, as inspectors, we do take that into consideration. We do look at the statistics if there's one or two. We have got guidance on how to kind of understand statistics where there's one or two. But we don't just look at gaps between people premium. There are other groups that we're also interested in, especially those people with special education needs and disability. But also the most able is a particular focus of ours, because one of the things we might know Sir Michael Wilshire was concerned about were students who come into school with really good stats level, but are not leaving with A starts, or then going on to Russell Group Universities. So these are some of the statistics that we look at and I look at and we think about in terms of the gaps and progress between different groups of pupils. Hotspots within this county, one of the things that I've been doing, I've been the link, link HMI since January, and somebody said to me, you're getting to know your, your, your authority. And one of the great things about being here today is I've spoken to individuals who have helped me to develop that picture. It's like a jigsaw where I'm putting pieces into the jigsaw. One of the things I've been looking at a lot recently is the data and thinking about clusters that require improvement, pockets of schools or areas of the county where there are schools that require improvement or in special measures, and also schools that were judged as good several years ago who are cruising along, but where there are big gaps in their data. Okay? So those are the things, the sort of what I've called hot spots. Now, one of the things I'm doing over the next few weeks is I'm working with um, data managers in, off in Offset to look further at these hotspots so we can be much more strategic in the way in which our, we approach our work with the local authority. And that's what we're hoping to do as an organisation. Because just like you, Offset is constantly looking to improve and do things better. Um, so that, that's my perception as it is. And I'm sure those people around will, a great time will come and say, well, actually, this is, this is an issue in Oxfordshire. Please come and tell me. Please come and share where you think perhaps these, we've talked about what hot spots are. If you've got um, insight into that, I'd really like to hear from you and for you to come and talk to me about those. Um, but, you know, one of the things that um, is writ large across all of this, across the new frameworks, across um, all our work, is the importance of governance. And I do not want to underestimate how important, what a difference good governance can make. You are very important to the improvement of a school. Okay? So what do we know? And what, what's been said? Well, we know that the partnerships that are being established within and between schools are often supported by strong governance. Governance. So you play a really crucial role in helping and supporting skills build partnerships, whether it's with other primary schools or other secondary schools or other partners. And we don't want you to forget ever how fundamentally important you are <coughs> because without strong and effective governance, schools just can't be as good as they should be. You are a crucial part of that whole, I suppose, raft of things that make schools good, not least the head teachers and school leaders in the world that do, but governors are very important. And that's what Sir Michael Wilshire said in 2012, and again in his annual report. And I'm not going to read that, I'm going to let you read it. <coughs> and we know that it's important, we know that it's in crucial, it's crucial, but unfortunately we don't go to schools where it's not, it's not good enough. And in those cases, we do often recommend an external review. And we're very glad that schools and governors are being very astute in the way that they're choosing those reviews. We don't have you know, a set body that do reviews, but I've noticed that governors are, and chairs of governors are being very thoughtful and considered and really shopping around for the best review of governance. I, I, I think that's a good approach to take. 
And what's very heartening for us is just like Ofsted is self-improving and, and, you know, looks to do its job better when governors have taken on board recommendations from the views. And what's even better is when they take recommendations on board and they go further. They say the review said this, but we've actually gone further and we've done this. What do we know about what's happening in the best schools? What do, the, what do school governors and leaders do? Because you are under the, the leadership section of the inspection framework. A very important part of what we do is, is retain and recruit good teachers. I know this is a really big issue in Oxfordshire. I've only been here since January, but I've actually listened to head teachers say, we're actually thinking of taking over that house over there, refurbishing it and make it into a place where teachers, you know, new teachers can live because they can't afford to live in Oxford. We're so desperate. And coming up with the government's coming up with some interesting and imaginative solutions. We know it's an issue in this particular local authority. But they also create a culture in which good teaching can flourish. And let's not forget an, or, the importance of an orderly, welcomed school. As governors walk through into reception, as you actually walk into the school and pass the children on the way, you can learn so much. I learn so much walking into a school. If I see the children pushing each other and hitting each other, you know, I, I, I think about well, you know, what are the expectations of behaviour in this school? And what we most want to do is work with teachers in their job of challenging children to do better, which is tough. Teaching is a tough job. It's intellectually demanding, it's emotionally you know, demanding, and it can be quite physically demanding as well. And, therefore, it's up to governors, where it's doing well, to reward good performance. To say, well done, your results have gone up. That's fantastic. You've worked really hard. And at the same time, the flip side of that reward <coughs> is actually to not tolerate inconsistent teaching or poor behaviour. And sometimes I have this phrase when I'm on inspection, I say, go with your gut, go with your gut. And what I mean by that is sometimes you're walking somewhere and you see something and you think, that's not right, that's not right. And sometimes, sometimes going with your gut is really important. This is from a recent Ofsted report, it's Burford, I was hoping Burford might be here today, but Burford was inspected a couple of weeks ago by a senior of mine, a colleague of mine, and he wrote this about their governance, and I wanted something very recent, a very recent report, it was a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and what's great about this is it really encapsulates a lot of what we know about effective governance, and what, what governance need to do to be effective. Because it includes knowing the academy well, or the school well. Including the strengths in teaching. And that's part of that knowing well, isn't it? <clears throat> they receive good data. And that data allows them to challenge leaders strong. I'll talk about that a bit more. And then it gives an example. Focusing in on pupil premium funding. Where there was a gap the governor's asked So it's a nice paragraph because it incorporates a lot of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about challenge. I'm going to talk about data. I'm going to talk about knowing the schools really well. So when we, talk, when we say, you know, these are, these are some of the things that make effective governance, you can see that from that document, I think there was a document um, that I've been using it, which has been called, I've been reading, School Governance Learning from the Best. When we talk about these really effective features of governing bodies, you can see how they link to our judgments and are, you know, are then formulated in our inspection reports. You can see that link and connection running through. So, what does our inspection tell us? One of the things about Ofsted is we gather a lot of information from inspection. We analyse reports, we analyse what's coming up, common themes, we analyse inspection grades and we spend a lot of time because they're very valuable sources of information and data for us. And what do they tell us? Well, one of the things is, and it's probably no surprise to you, is that there are variations in the performance of schools across the country and within the local authorities. So just because we're in a local authority, there can be a local school sort of at one end, even in one, one town that's doing really well, and then another that's not doing as well. So these massive variations. 
Um, there's inequality of access to good schools. So in some areas, children, parents can choose from a lot of good schools. In other areas, there isn't a local good school for parents to, to choose. There's an attainment gap which we feel is unacceptable for pupils eligible for free school meals. Because they're the very people who are most vulnerable in our society. They're the people who need, we really need to work with and ensure achieve if we are going to have a society that's fairer. And when we talk about moral purpose, I think, when we think about it as educators, what is it that really drives us? It's that sense that for some people in this, in this society, it's not very fair and their lives are pretty tough. And the only thing that's going to really help them in their lives is achieving those five A stars to see which will enable them to access the next stage of their education, get to college and, and, and really, you know, have a better life. And effective governance is a <coughs> part of good leadership, but it is not yet universal. So it's important. There are aspects, you know, there are areas where it's good, but it is not yet universal. And that's really important to recognise that we have moved a long way, but it, good governance is not yet universal. Some common issues, okay? I'm going to just let you read those. So when, when we say it's not yet good, why is it not yet good? What is it that we're finding? These are some of the things, okay? I think it's really important to remember um, that often it's the governors who appoint head teachers. And I often speak to chairs of governors who say to me, we've just appointed the head, we didn't really want to, um, we didn't really want to go in too hard with the head teacher because we've just appointed them. Um, and one of the things I talk about is the idea that a challenge doesn't have to be hostile. If you challenge someone, it doesn't need to be a hostile experience. Because I also hear from heads who say, I'd love it if the governors challenged me. It would be really great. I could show them exactly how effective I'm being. It doesn't have to be a bruising experience. It's very important that you do it, even for new head teachers. And sometimes there's a bit of an attitude which we've come across, which is that the head, because head teachers are appointed by governors, they're your man or woman. You've appointed them, they're your man or woman. And that sometimes occasionally means that if they are not doing as good a job or things are not going as well as they should, sometimes we, um, governors don't always perhaps speak out as quickly as they could about that, air their feelings. They might have them inside and they might be hmm, a bit disappointed, I don't think this is going well, but they don't always air them because they were your choice. That's some of the things that we've found. One of the things I think that's really important is the over-reliance on information solely from the teacher. And that's where you using your personal and professional experience is so important. First of all, I think, you know, um, trying to get the information you want on the school, how you want it. Don't be afraid to say to head teachers, I know there's head teachers here, actually we, we want it in a different way. We need that information sorted differently. It's not clear to us at the moment. We need it like this. Okay? That's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine to check things out. You said this. You said there's no bad behaviour in school. Everybody, you know, um, comes in an orderly fashion. There's no low level disruption. Negotiate, you know, make sure there's parameters and I'll talk about business to school. Go and check it out. I think sometimes <coughs> a little bit of healthy cynicism. Healthy cynicism, it is good. You know, let's recognise that there is sometimes a gap between what people say and the reality. And it's very important that you are there to question that gap. But the only way you're going to find it out is if you go and find for yourself. I don't mean you should be in school every day, believe you me, but you think carefully about the kind of information that most will help you. It might be reports from governors who have links to subjects, it might be popping into school, it might be other activities. But you can set that agenda. The development plan is your biggest help. Right? You need it. The school development plan is your toolkit. Okay? It helps you to see where the school's going, 
And the milestones along the way are really important. And a number of times I've sat with school leaders and said, what is a milestone? And a milestone along the way, because it's often governors who measure these milestones, is what you expect at that point, suppose it's a year plan, it's what you expect, say, in March, not to be happening, because we're not constantly looking at what's happening, are we? It's what you expect the impact to be. So at that point in March, what should be the impact of what you do? And when we talk about impact, I always focus on children, students, young people. Not necessarily, it doesn't have to be necessarily academic impact, but what difference are the measures you're taking making to young people? Not, not just to teachers, but to the young people. And that's a really important focus. So if you look at a school improvement plan, <coughs> I can't really get my head around this and I'm not really sure what my role is or, or what I'm meant to be looking at when I go in and, you know, with these milestones, what am I, what am I meant to be checking? How do I know that the school is, is doing what it says? Have a conversation, get them tighter, get them written in a more maybe effective and succinct manner because then your monitoring will be more effective because it talks about the limited role in monitoring the impact of actions. And one of the things um, that we often talk about in Oxford, and I know people here have even this morning talked to me about, is about the fact that it's not always what you do, it's the impact. And sometimes that's tough. Because school improvement is a complex business. It's a very complex thing. It takes a lot of work. And with the best will in the world, sometimes we do things, and we work really hard at them, and they don't have an impact. And it's sometimes very hard to say to people, it's not working. I know it's your baby, and I know you've been up all night trying to make it work, and I know you're very passionately committed. We've got passion, uh, lots of passion, but actually it's not working. And sometimes it's a governor's role to have that hard head and say, actually, it's not working. Let's do something else. And that comes to, you can only make that decision, I think, if you're focusing on impact, if you just focus on what people are doing, then you're not able to make that kind of hard-headed decision that you need to. Last one, limited understanding of data and school quality. We know that the data that comes out of school can be complex. <coughs> we see lots of different ways in which governors um, have really upskilled themselves through working with local authorities, getting training on how to read the data. And we know it can be a tricky business. That's why you shouldn't shy away as governors from asking for help from outside bodies like local authorities, whoever you're partnering with, to get some more help to understand the data. Or asking the school to present the data in a way that is more meaningful and easy to analyse. The data is important though. And the reason why the data is important is that objectivity. You know, when we talk about measuring the impact, often what we're talking about is the progress that students make. And what the data gives you is the insight into that. It cuts out the rhetoric. Because I think we've all been in schools where we're told, well, this is great, this is wonderful, but actually, is it? Now, the... Um, the document that I just show, showed you, Learning from the Best, I can't recommend it enough. I'm sure many of you have read it. But this um, Ofsted publication really outlines what we know about effective governance in quite a lot of detail. And I really recommend that you read it. So we're just going to have a little think about some of the specifics that, that, that this document talks about. Okay. So it goes through these five ways, <coughs> these five sort of behaviours or aspects of good governance. And the first one is knowing your school. Good governors, highly effective governing bodies, know their schools. Okay? That's key. So if, if somebody said, what do good governors need to do? I'd say, know their schools. And the development plan, again, crucial to that knowledge. That's your lens into the school. But also comes with that pupil progress data. But also information on the quality of teaching. And school visits. 
And we think, you know, we do think they are important. We don't think you should be in every day. I think it's very important that you're very clear about the protocols and the purpose of the visits. Different schools will have different reasons for wanting you to come. So when you set foot in a school to visit, whether it's to look at a classroom, to look at teaching, to meet with a leader or a subject leader, I think it's very important that governors know, why am I here? What am I doing here? What am I hoping to get out of this visit? What's the purpose? And what are the protocol, protocols of this visit? How, how do I need to conduct myself? How should I behave? What, what, what's going to be kind of acceptable within that visit? And that's got to be all out, very clear, very transparent. Because it's not fair on you to walk into a school without having that clear understanding. And if that happens, because you're giving up your time to come to a school, maybe during a working day when you've already got jobs and other, um, other things to do, an hour in school, because you've established those, will give you a huge amount of rich information. But if those aren't established beforehand, the dangers in our school can leave you perhaps a little bit confused and without the information that you need. So those protocols, purpose being established is really important. And that's a discussion, obviously, with the leaders, a very transparent and open discussion to have. And I think it's very important that you... Um, challenge the school to provide you with the high quality information that you want and information about the quality of teaching that you understand. I've been talking with uh, people here today about the fact that there aren't any teaching grades that we give. We don't give grades for lessons now. But schools now have got different, different ways of monitoring teaching. Some of them continue to give grades. We don't advocate, you know, we don't ourselves give grades, but we don't advocate a way that schools do it. So what I think is important is governors work with schools to get that information in a way that really meets their needs. But you do, I think, need the information about the quality of teaching. And what I urge you to do and school leaders to do is please do not look at that in isolation without achievement. Because one of the things I sometimes say to schools when they tell me 99% of the teachers are good is I say, if 99% of the teachers are good, why are your results below floor standard? Okay? And one of the things we have to do at gov as governors, and I do it and you can do it, is we just think it doesn't add up. And that's what you need to have anti-town eye for. Is it adding up? Is it adding up? Because that's not about my understanding of the data. I think that's what I call common sense. If your teachers are all brilliant, why are the results not where they where, why are they not higher? And when um, we talk about asking questions, in learning from the best, the, the, the governing body invented three questions, three lots of questions. They were complicated. The three questions of it were, why are you doing this? How would it make a difference to young people? How will you check it's working? And whenever the school did anything, they asked the same three questions. They weren't long, they weren't convoluted, all the governors understood them, but they were so powerful. Please do not shy away from asking questions. I often call it the Columbo moment in school, that old dete American detective. When he sort of goes, he's just about on the way out, isn't he? He goes, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. It's almost like you're playing dumb but you're not. And it's that question that makes the, a big difference. If people and leaders are using words you don't understand, you know, ask them what it means. Because, you know, in Ofsted we are very committed to not using jargon or trying not to use jargon in the letters that we write. And we get very thoroughly QA'd. And if I use something that's considered to be jargon, I get told to take it out because we really want everybody to understand our letters now. And to report them. You might say, well, you're not there yet, and I can, I can say we're not, but we're working towards it. So if the words you don't understand, phrases, you know, ask about it. You need that clarification to do your job, and school leaders should be more than willing to give you that clarification. But as most things in life, you know, we often come back to this, don't we? Personal relationships, building a relationship. If you've got a good relationship with your head teacher, with the leaders, you are going to get the information on you. 
So emotional intelligence, I think governments need that ability to build relationships, have emotional intelligence in <coughs> absolutely, you know, huge, huge amounts. And a clarity of your roles. Absolute clarity. What am I meant to be doing on this committee? What am I here for? And what am I hoping to achieve by being here? And what's the school moving towards? What, is it, what are its aims? So you need that absolute clarity, because we all need that. I needed to know today what, what, what you wanted from me and what I was here for. Because we can't be effective unless we have that knowledge. And if you haven't, if you're unsure about that, I think it's perfectly reasonable to work with the head teacher to get that established. So the other thing is support and challenge. And this is a balance, isn't it? And I'm sure you're all very experienced in this balance between support and our challenge and challenge. And I'm not going to go through that because it's a lot of what I've said today. I think support comes in lots of different ways. Um, I've seen governors, um, head teachers, who are in schools in challenging circumstances, who have had to deal with some profoundly difficult staffing issues. HR staffing issues. And it's often the governors who have saved them from going under. I can't tell you how important your role is. Because if you can provide support through these difficult HR issues and staffing and finance issues, then the head teacher has got some um, energy and, I suppose, uh, intellect left to deal with the issue of improving the school. <coughs> so that, using knowledge, skills and experience, what I often think is, well, I, you know, when, when I hear from governors and chairs of governors who said, we, you know, we were very lucky, we had somebody who had HR skills, and they helped us work through this really difficult situation. As a result, it's resolved a lot quicker. Or they had financial skills, or they were brilliant at advertising and media, and they were able to help us with our newsletter. So using knowledge, skills, and experience, and recognising that a lot of them are transferable. Yes, it is helpful to have somebody with an education experience on a governing body. I'd be absolutely naive to say it wouldn't, it wasn't. But there are other skills that come from other walks of life, industry, commerce, that are really valuable as well. And there's good crossover of those skills. So I'd encourage governors to, to use the skills that they bring to the, bring to the body. This is really important. The clerk, I met your clerk today, uh, he greeted me as I came in, but clerks are so important. And I think one of the things is, if you've got a really good system of recording your minutes, because what Ofsted do is they get told things, okay, they get told things like, we always hold the, we, all the, we always challenge the head teacher about safeguard. And safeguard is really big, it's a, a much bigger priority in the new, the new phone that this year. So we always challenge the head teacher about safeguarding. We always try and relate our evidence. So what do we do? We go to the minutes. And we see the head teacher spoke about safeguarding. Where's, where's the challenge there? How do I know that what I've been told is happening? Please write down your questions. Now, it doesn't have to be as a script or, you know, in great deal of detail, but what we want to be able to do, and I know some people do this in red, and you've got different ways of doing it, but clerks play a very important role because they are taking the minutes, and the minutes are important because they're a good source of evidence. And if you are asking challenging questions, let's have them writ large. Let's have them in red so that we can see straight away the kind of questions you're ask, asking and, if possible, a summary of the answers. So the role of the clerk is very important. But it's also about communication within the team. I always sometimes think with the team of governors, I, I have to wonder how governing bodies will um, ever cope with that email. Because it's so helpful to be able to get those documents. I just think, how did they manage when everything had to be sent by very, post? Very hard work. It was very hard work, wasn't it? But you know, getting the documents beforehand, how important is it, if you're going to a meeting where there is a lot of data, to have those documents a little bit beforehand so you can actually, but even if you've just had a chance to look through them and, and work out what, what you need a bit more help with. 
Committee is really important. We don't have a set view of committees and there's guidance and there's new guidance being published from the DfE about all this, which I'm sure you're very knowledgeable about because there's a huge amount of experience in this room. But one other thing that's really important is there's been a bit more of a freeing up about how governors work. And you have to get the committee structure that suits you. Some governing bodies don't have committees. So, you know, they've gone for a more um, sort of interim executive board uh, model where they have a very small team of, pe of people working on just one agenda item, which is improving the progress of the students in the school. Other governing bodies have different committees and that works really well. So I'm not advocating one, one size fits all. You have to do what's right for your school. But I think what's really important is that those committees are appropriately focused on the areas that most need improving and work well both as a committee but also as you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. And I think above everything else, and I say this to school leaders as well, it's the monitoring. It's the monitoring work that you do. It's the way you check and evaluate and monitor the progress of the school. And monitoring is not an end in itself, it's a means. Because one of the things I think it's really important is what do we do as a result of monitoring? That's what often we look for on improvement plans. You monitored in March, you kept, in March you checked, you know, you checked everybody to see how well they were doing in English. You looked at all their levels. And what did you do as a result of that monitoring? What changed, what, did, what happened differently because you monitored? Right that large, that's really, an, you know, that's a really important part of effective governance. Because we came in here and we saw this and we weren't really happy with the way the spelling was being taught, this happened. This is the change we made. Monitoring is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. And recording the outcome of that monitoring is very important work that Clark's doing, bringing it back together. The last one is, I think, really important. Because you are a real, a very important interface between the school and the community. Often, if governors can go out to the community and explain why the school is doing what it is doing, that's a very powerful thing that governors can do. Because you're a great link with parents. And you have a really important role in perhaps organising for future partnerships, so creating more partnerships for schools, and because you have sort of, you, um, I suppose you can broker links in the outside world, whether it's with other schools or with other organisations. But also making sure that parents are clear about why things are going on in schools. Because um, as parents, I think we've all been in the position where we've heard from our child what's going on. And, you know, you know the teacher really picked on me. And you get on the phone and you're really cross because it's your darling, isn't it? And then you find out, actually... Your child hasn't done their homework and, and you know, they've, they may have done other things. So what I'm saying is there's always two sides. And the governors play an important part in perhaps spreading <coughs> the message to the community. Especially in schools where they've had to make big changes. Because I think, you know, change can be difficult. Especially as a parent. When you've also got a, another hundred things to do. Why is the school suddenly asking us to, you know, uh, you know have a reading book on reading and write, write these messages every night? Or why is the school suddenly sending everybody home who isn't in the correct uniform? That's really inconvenient. But I think governors play a really important role in explaining to parents why these changes have been made and the importance of them. So I think, you know, engaging with others. And this sometimes is done through newsletters um, and meetings. I've seen all sorts of different um, models and approaches to this. Um, I know that governors sometimes attend rewards evenings at schools, theatre productions. I think that's a really important way of kind of engaging with the parents and the other stakeholders. And I really thank governors for the time they put into working with schools in this way. But it is a really important part of what you do. Because sometimes um, there's, a, a, there's misunderstandings there. And they can be quite damaging. Because if a head teacher of a school, and a school that's trying to improve a lot, is dealing with parents who are very angry and cross and upset, then that can take it away from the job that they've got to do, which is improving the progress that the students make. So that work that you do you know, with parents and community is very important. Okay. So overall, 
you make a difference. <coughs> you don't need to wait to get an external review of governance. Okay? You don't need to be told by Ofsted to have an external review of governance. You can commission one yourselves if you think the governing body could work better. And I often go to schools that are good and outstanding and say, we did our own review of governance, we commissioned it for ourselves. I think, though, the second one down is the most important. It's not just what you do. It's how you transmit high ambitions for a school. <coughs> and that's through your language, through your questioning, through the way in which you interact with the head teachers. It's, a, it, it's, it's bigger, isn't it, than a set of tick-off activities. It's about culture and ethos. But sharing and showing that you have high aspirations for the young people in that school is very important. So school leaders say, you know, children from, children from this estate, they never do well. You can say, don't they? Why don't they? Why shouldn't they? And that's absolutely fantastic when governors do that. And then, I think the other thing great about governors, the great talent spotters. The talent spotters, because you've all met talented people, and you know that there's sometimes people out there who are not yet brilliant, but they've got potential. They've got the potential, and you can see it because you've got that insight. So I think it's very important you have a role in developing the leadership potential of people, on the, of, of colleagues, on the staff, and you grow that potential. And you use your skills, because you're part of working with leaders, to model effective leadership. And part of that is being you know, involved in panels where you do actually appoint teachers and head teachers and thinking about the questions you ask because everybody can go on Google and get questions to ask the head teacher to interview and I'm sure I've done it myself, I've looked at those questions I'm sure there's hundreds of questions but what's really important because you know the school is what are going to be the best questions you can ask this candidate for your school at this particular time in the school's development <coughs> So I think you play a really important part. You're often on interview panels. And my goodness, what a difference good staff make. If we could say the one most important thing in the school, obviously the head teacher, but it's the staff who work alongside that head teacher. You get a good member of staff, something that was a concern and a worry. So for example, a reception can be turned around within weeks if you get the right person. Conversely, if you choose the wrong person, something that is working well, can certainly be a cause for concern. And we know within that is the importance of your safe, importance of safer recruitment and safeguarding, which is very important that governors have their eye on looking at those application forms and questioning and thinking about any anomalies there. You have a really important role in asking the safeguarding <coughs> questions. Because it's what often what, one of the things that for safeguarding we ask people to do is think the unthinkable. Think the unthinkable. And it's really important as governors, you have that distance, you have that really great distance to be able to think the unthinkable. And finally, reviewing your own activities. I've talked about review. To constantly ask yourselves within, you know, appropriately, you know, at the right time, so it doesn't take, you know, take up all your time. Are we doing, you know, why are we doing this? What are we trying to achieve? Have we made a difference? Are we working well enough? Could we work better? Just because we've been doing this for the last 10 years and meeting in a committee like this, does that mean we have to continue? Is that working best for this school at the moment? Are we doing well enough? You know, as governors, because you're asking and challenging the head teacher to do better, I think that should be modelled by you challenging yourselves to do better. And reviewing your terms of reference. So it's not just beginning of the term, you know, you read out the terms of reference for a committee, who, who votes for that, everybody's hand goes up. What about, actually, I think the terms of reference should actually be more focused here. Because <coughs> I've just looked at your results and students aren't reading as much as they should. So why don't we, have, why don't we include that in our terms of reference? And then what's fantastic as governors is you can look out. Many of you are governors. <coughs> of more than one school, have involvement in several schools. One of the things I've been really impressed with today is I've met people who said, well, I'm actually a teacher here, I'm a governor here, I also work here. 
How brilliant is that? What a great amount of knowledge and experience can you bring to your roles because you are uh, working in different schools and looking outside to what's going on and bringing in good and best practice. And that's a really important thing that governors can, can do. So, 